The very first bit I did for Veloci was the Dune Buggy Handbook, which is this one here. And uh, this was done about ten years ago, I guess. And at the time, there was no book that, that actually covered the, the history and different types of mark of beach buggy, uh, or dune buggy as they're called in America. And I'd done a, uh, a feature for Volksworld magazine, which was a beach buggy buyer's guide, just to try and encourage people back in the 80s to know a little bit more about what kind of buggy they'd got. So a lot of people had bought buggies to restore, doing up old ones and that sort of thing, um, but hadn't really any clue about what they had got. So that's where the idea came from. And uh, I remember writing to Rod and saying, I've got the greatest idea for a new book uh, since sliced bread, expecting the letter to be thrown in the bin for the contempt it deserved. But instead, Rod wrote back and said, great, I think you've got a good idea here, let's go ahead with it. So that's where this one came from. And this covers about 60 different marks of beach buggy, or dune buggy. Um, some little uh, information on the history as well, some great colour sections, a lot of archive images in here that had never ever been compiled together before. And it's still one of the, um, the best sellers of the, the buggy range of books I've done. And I'm very, very proud of it. So how many years. times have been reprinted now? It's about three or four, I think, yeah. something like that. And it's still going strong. People yeah. still buy it. So I'm delighted about that. Okay. Let's move on to another one. Uh, let's go to this, the, the Dune Buggy Files. Now, the Dune Buggy Files uh, is, is really kind of three things in one because what you've got here is some of the history of, of the buggies, i.e. buggies past, then on to current manufacturers and, and the buggy scene generally uh, as it was a few years ago now, but that's kind of uh, present. And then this book also includes a large section on concept car team buggies, which is the future. And it's quite interesting how many mainstream manufacturers have actually had their own takes on a buggy. So everybody from Beartona, to, to Ford and Volkswagen themselves have done some kind of uh, updated version of a dune buggy. Um, so really, depending what you like, whether you like uh, the original uh, Bruce Mayer style, kind of Mayer's Manx type buggy, or something a little bit more modern, this really has got it all. And I uh, had great fun researching this with, with manufacturers. Um, I think they all thought it was uh, slightly crazy trying to, to compile something on, on buggies past and, and present and in the future. But there we are, for, um, so I hope people will go out and buy that one. Okay. These are the Dean Buggy Phenomenon, book one and book two. And really these arose because when I did the Dean Buggy Handbook, I did an introduction about the, the history of the buggy scene, but it was a fairly limited um, content within the Dean Buggy Handbook. And so Dean Buggy Phenomenon one was really to say, uh, what is the history of the buggy, both from its American roots um, right up to the kind of the end of the 1960s? And the, the thing everybody forgets with with the dune buggy scene is it didn't really begin in the 1960s. It actually began in the 1920s. And what happened was, um, after the First World War, people in America were looking for fun cars, and they used to use stripped-down sedans, which they would put kind of big wheels on, take some of the body off and they drive them on what are called backcountry routes in America and right down to, to the water's edge. Some of that was for fun, some of it was for commercial hire and so that was the, the origins of a dune buggy. And then you get into kind of the late 1950s and the Volkswagen Beetle first started to be imported into America at that time. And a guy called Scott McKenzie uh, had a wrecked Beetle outside uh, the back of a garage and what he found was that if he took the fenders off it and the, the front and the back of it, he had a very nimble and manoeuvrable vehicle, which was uh, rear-engined, air-cooled. And so that was the, the, the very beginnings of the dune buggy. He then went on to, to take the whole body off, and he found he could drive the, the, the flat uh, floor pan of a Volkswagen Beetle, which had all the running gear attached on it. Um, and uh, he also found out that by putting the, the Chevrolet Corvair engine in, you could get a fantastic power-to-weight ratio in, in the buggy. Two other guys came on the scene about that time, a guy called Bill Harkey and Bill Chisholm, and they found also that you could take a chunk out of the Volkswagen floor pan, shorten it down considerably, so it was far more manoeuvrable and had a much shorter turning circle. And uh, they also moved the seats right back, so they had all the weight over the back axle, uh, extended the, the steering column, 
and also they welded Chevrolet wheels onto the, the centres of Volkswagen hubs so that uh, increased the kind of flotation, tyre flotation at the back. And that was the, the kind of essence of the very, very first dune buggies. Um, people had sort of stuffed uh, uh, V8 engines and things into early chassis um, in the 1950s, but they were very kind of crude types of vehicle. And it was in the early 60s that other people started coming into the scene. Uh, guys like Ted Mangles, who built uh, a, a Volkswagen-based dune buggy called Splinters, and Roger Smith at Pepper Tree Automotive, who also built a, a car called Rivets, and they, they were kind of very crude dune buggies. But all the elements were sort of beginning to, to take uh, shape in some kind of embryonic form. The next big thing that happened really was with um, a very skilled boat builder, a guy called Bruce Mayers, who had gone to, to see sailboats being, being raced at uh, Pismo Beach in California. And he suddenly realised that by having a very lightweight um, chassis and possibly with a body on it as well, that this could be raced extremely successfully on the sand. He experimented firstly with his Volkswagen Combi van, put um, big wheels on the back of that, lowered the tyre pressures, cut the wheel uh, arches out just to make it a bit more manoeuvrable. But um, he found that really weight was his enemy there. So instead he decided to build something from scratch. And being a very skilled uh, pattern maker, he designed this very short, stubby little glass fibre monocoque car uh, which had Volkswagen running gear in it and uh, stiffeners, metal stiffeners in it, like a Porsche hoop. And uh, he called it the Mayer's Manx. And suddenly, he built this just for himself, suddenly the world and his wife wanted one of these things. It was the, the kind of archetypal buggy shape, very similar to this one, this is a GP, but uh, similar in shape. And um, from that, uh, you know, he, he, he started manufacturing them. It was kind of a part-time business for him. But the big problem really was that the price was far too high. Having a monocoque type shape, um, it just could not be done cheaply enough. So he built 12 of those monocoque cars. Uh, some of those still exist today. But he then took the, the essence of what some of the early dune buggy builders had done with a shortened Volkswagen chassis. So all the running gear, everything had come from a base uh, donor Volkswagen. They were very cheap, they were easily available, very, very, uh, very easy to find. And to that he added this, this glass fibre top, uh, which was the, the buggy we all know and love today. Suddenly the whole thing just took on a huge bloom. It, everybody wanted one. Uh, people wanted them in films. Steve McQueen drove one. Paul Newman drove one. It was just the biggest thing. Um, so the stars got, got uh, involved uh, in, in driving buggies. and They were seen on, in a lot of films at that time. And the whole essence of it kind of took off worldwide and uh, manufacturers uh, started up in, in Germany and, and Holland, specifically that imported cars from the east coast of America and then copied them. And then in Britain there were two early manufacturers that came into the scene. The very first one was called Volksrod, run by a guy called Warren Monks, and he designed his own buggy from scratch, a very crude looking type of buggy called the Volksrod Mark I but also a young racing mechanic called Pierre Duplessis from South Africa had actually imported a Manx from, from the States, modified it slightly and christened it the GP Beach Buggy, which is, which is this one here. And um, it, it just took off. It just took off in a way that you probably can't imagine these days, you know, having these wild extrovert type fun cars with chrome exhaust hanging out of the back, wide wheels, uh, very flamboyant, very noisy, very extrovert. It was, it was a whole kind of cult that started up in the 1970s. D does it still have a following today then, would you say? It still certainly has yeah. a following. There's still quite a lot of buggy clubs. Um, there are still a few manufacturers, both in this country and the States. Um, but it's not quite the same because the whole kind of culture of the world has changed. Um, everything's now far more regulated in, in a way that wasn't back then. But the great thing is when you build one of these cars, which is still fairly cheap to build, you just can have a huge amount of fun. So as, as uh, Bruce and I would always say, you get more smiles for your money with, with one of these than anything else.